see it it were the day we lost the captain yeah he fell overboard he was drunk as usual we tax and turns about but it was too late the water had gone bright red and then we see the fins they were a pack of tiger sharks and they was ripping him to pieces they ain't big sharks tigers eight nine foot apiece i suppose but when there's 10 or 15 on them there ain't a lot you can do within oh i'd say probably a minute and a half there was nothing left of him nothing 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 at all not a piece of skin nothing all the bones had gone and they'd eaten the bloody lot they had ah that was a bad day that was bad day hello and welcome to beyond japan an interdisciplinary podcast that is the broad reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Japanese Studies at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. I'm your host, Oliver Moxon, Project Support Officer at the Sainsbury Institute and Researcher of Japanese War Heritage. This week we are joined by J. Alyssa White, PhD candidate in archaeology at the University of Oxford, to discuss the prehistoric tragedy of the world's oldest shark attack victim. The 3,000-year-old remains of Tsukumo No. 24 were first excavated in Okayama Prefecture in the early 20th century, covered in hundreds of small cuts or lesions to the bone, which had baffled archaeologists until now after Alyssa, along with a team of researchers, compared the damage to that of contemporary shark attacks. Certainly a rare archaeological find if the description we just heard of a contemporary attack is anything to go by. Join us as we explore the final moments of Tsukumo number 24 in amazing detail. We hope you enjoy the show. Good afternoon, Alicia. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, Holly. So first off, we want to know a bit more about you. Can you tell us about your area of expertise and how your interests have brought you there? Uh, so I'm a DPhil doctoral student at the University of Oxford, looking at skeletal trauma from the transition from the Jomon period to the Aoi period, so from the hunter-gatherer period to the early agricultural period on the Japanese archipelago. Uh, and I did my master's looking at the stable isotopes and radiocarbon dating of the hunter-gatherers around Lake Baikal in Siberia, and you know somehow ended up here working on shark attacks. All right. How did you get into that line of research in the first place, if you don't mind me asking? Um, from when I was about a sophomore in university, I knew that I wanted to work on Japanese archaeology. And there wasn't anyone in Auburn, Alabama really doing that in the States. So I had to kind of find a way to make connections and learn about the archaeology itself. And so I, I was studying Japanese language and I knew that I loved anthropology. And I just decided to combine both of them in graduate school and was fortunate in that I could work with um, Rick Schulting, my supervisor, and then my external co-supervisor, uh, Mark Hudson, um, on this particular project. Right. So how did you get to looking at traumatic damage to archaeological skeletons? So I was really intrigued by the transition from the Jomon to the Ayoi period. And violence and warfare have been looked at and the role that they played in that transition and in the periods of in and of themselves. But actual analysis of the skeletal remains for evidence of violent trauma in a systematic way hadn't been done yet. And I really wanted to compile that kind of data and be able to say something a bit more substantive about that question because there have been some really excellent review studies done looking at previously reported skeletal injuries and tying that into violence and warfare. But if you're not going in and looking at the skeletons in a lot of fine detail in a consistent manner, you tend to miss a lot of things. Additionally, these are you know kind of site reports and studies that have been compiled over years 
Uh, so you're not using similar methodology throughout, which is natural. So it, it makes it a bit more difficult to say things with a great deal of detail and with a great deal of, with the amount of nuance that I wanted to. I see. Fascinating. So the focus of this episode is your recent article on a 3000 year old shark attack victim, but to put into context how rare it is to find the remains of a shark attack victim, could you first tell us what other archaeological sites of conflict you have researched? Uh, so from the Jomon period, I've looked at about 15 sites. And then from the Yayoi period, I've looked at more sites. Mm -hmm. And no, no shark attack cases within that. If you really want to get a handle on how rare it is to find an archaeological shark attack case, um, you have to really think of the conflation of uh, circumstances, how rare a shark attack is even today with our population, uh, global population, um, how likely it is that the individual would have been covered, how likely they would have been buried in a context that would preserve their remains, how likely they would have been discovered and properly recorded whenever they were excavated, how likely they would be to at a museum collection, and then how likely it is that a researcher would come along and, and look for something like this in detail. <laughs> I see, so quite unlikely then. So <laughs> when you're looking at uh, remains of someone who's died a violent death in conflict, what sort of injuries would you find on the remains that indicate that? So you can look at uh, a whole host of things. From the Jomon period, we're mainly focusing um, on the cranium because the Jomon period doesn't have metal weapons. Uh, you, you get those with the Yayoi period. Uh, so you're looking at uh, stone tools during the Jomon period. And uh, you can, we see things like embedded arrowheads at times and things like that. Uh, but you can also with the cranium look at kind of blunt force injuries to the cranium. And it's been shown that injuries to the cranium in certain areas tend to be uh, more related to, to violent conflict. So that's what we were doing with the Jomon. And then with the Yayoi, you can get things like that with kind of blunt force injuries. We tend to get more sharp force lesions from metal weapons. And also uh, there, there are some really, I say nice, but I, by nice, I mean very clear uh, cases of things like bronze sword tips being embedded in people's spines and things like that. Wow. <laughs> you can, yeah, exactly. You can argue that that's really the most direct form of human conflict you can ever get. Uh, there's only so many reasons that an arrow or a sword is going to be in someone's back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's the kinds of things that you can look at. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess in, this, in, that, in that sense, uh, well, we'll turn to your shark attack victim now, and uh, that, that should show how unusual it must have been to find these kind of injuries on a Jomon era. Uh, skeleton. So this shark attack victim is affectionately named uh, Tsukumo number 24. So our listeners can make a mental image. The remains of the victim are covered in deep sharp lesions with fractures to the ribs and pelvis and they're also missing a right leg and left hand. In the article you mentioned that, that the remains were excavated in the early 20th century yet the cause of death had not been determined until now. How do you come to the conclusion of a shark attack and what else do we know about the victim as a person? That's correct. So this individual, uh, number 24, is from Skumo Kaizuka um, along the Seto Inland Sea in Okayama Prefecture. And he was excavated um, around 1920 um, by one of the excavations led by Kenji Kiyono, who was an archaeologist at Kyoto University, uh, which is why his remains are there now. And we know that he uh, didn't have his right leg and his left hand at the time of burial because there are photographs from the original excavation, which is absolutely brilliant. We didn't know uh, that this individual had all of these lesions, the traumatic lesions all over his body whenever we went to Kyoto University to investigate him. Uh, we went in 2016 for just a couple of weeks, uh, my supervisor, uh, another doctoral student and I, and literally in the last hour, we opened the box that has his remains in it. And we started pulling out bones to examine. And <laughs> the more we pulled out, the more puzzled we were. And I, you know, kind of pulled Rick up. I was like, Rick, this doesn't look normal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> why does the tibia, the shin bone have this many sharp force lesions to it? This, this is odd. And we were a little frustrated because we just didn't have time to look at him. Uh, we were leaving the country. <laughs> um, 
So we had to, we just laid them out as quickly as we could and snapped some photos uh, to look at when we were back in Oxford. And then I kind of put a pin in it so that the next year when I went back to, to Kyoto University, I would know to look at his remains in detail. And when I did, I, I recorded things like the completeness of his skeleton and demographic information, like his age and his sex and so on and so forth. Um, and really went to, to town and recording those lesions in detail. And it's a lot to record in detail because I kept on finding more. <laughs> <laughs> it's it was a lot to re to record all of those but as i was doing it we were originally looking at him as a potential case of what's called overkill so it's whenever you injure the body to such an extent that the aim isn't just to kill the individual you're trying to achieve something else but the injuries if that had been the case would have been more consistent with things like metal weapons and like i said those don't exist from this time period in japanese prehistory and then they all had this really consistent serrated pattern on the margins, uh, which also wouldn't match any known weapons. And additionally, just the number of lesions and their concentrations and different parts of the body it was baffling. So I was emailing Rick through all of this because he was up in Hokkaido doing his own data collection. And I was like, I don't know what these are. Uh, so we kind of ruled out human conflict because it didn't make sense. And then we began to look at things like terrestrial carnivores. There aren't that many of those in Japan or scavengers, uh, terrestrial ones. And these weren't matching the lesions that we were seeing. And then uh, we started to, to look further afield. And that's when we started to look at things like marine scavenging because I had heard it suggested that maybe these were caused by something like crab scavenging. And uh, when I first, you know, kind of threw that over to Rick, I was like, well, someone said this. Uh, he said, well, I was at a crab restaurant last night uh, in Hokkaido and I was looking at the crab claws and I just don't see how it could happen. <laughs> it's like, we, we just weren't convinced. Uh, and then we just stumbled across an image of a femur from a shark attack victim. And it was really just kind of a eureka moment. We're like, oh, that matches it really well. And the more we looked into shark attack cases, the more we could see where it matched up. It had these serrated lesions like tiger sharks and white sharks have, and their, their, their teeth are serrated, so it would match that. Um, the pattern made sense. And we reached out to Mr. George Fergus, who um, is associated with the, the International Shark Attack file. And we, we asked him, you know, do you think this could be a shark attack? We don't have experience with shark attacks as archaeologists. <laughs> uh, and he was very quick to, to confirm our suspicions. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so no one had ever commented on the strange cut marks in the remains before? It was just the case that they dug it up and put it straight into storage? Or what happened there? Um, I believe that it's been commented in the sense that his, his burial position was odd and they, it's been posited some kind of human modification to his body before, before death, but never, I think, and the traumatic lesions have never been described in detail. And the, the reason that his burial is a bit strange is A, like if you're missing the leg and the hand, um, but also the left leg was obviously um, not really attached at the time of burial. It was kind mm. of placed on top of him in an inverted position. So he was in quite a state when he, he, he was buried. Yeah, yeah, I see. So I would like to paint a picture of the events for our listeners because I was amazed when going through the UR article how much can be determined from a 3000 year old skeleton. So first of all, what could number 24 have been doing at the time of the attack? So the Jamon were fisher hunter gatherers and the archeological artifacts from Skumo are consistent with that. So you have things like fish hooks, He's buried in a shell mound, uh, you know, which is a shell midden created by uh, human consumption of shellfish. Uh, I should note that the great thing about him being buried in the shell mound is that it protects his, it protected his bones from the rather acidic soil in Japan mm. uh, so that there is a skeleton. Because if you just, most pit burials from the Jomon period that aren't buried in shell mounds don't survive, the, the human remains are, are gone. You might have the artifacts, but that's about it. Uh, so he was buried in a shell mound. We also have, my colleagues have done, and, and co-authors have done analysis of the stable isotopic composition of his bones. And we know that he was consuming marine food. 
they did this alongside the radiocarbon dating of him. Mm-hmm. And so we have all of this evidence that you know, he was consuming marine food, uh, the Jomon had canoes, it's quite reasonable to think that he was probably in the water uh, fishing or, or diving, and most likely in deeper water because more um, severe shark attacks tend to occur in deeper water. And most fatal shark attacks that are unprovoked tend to either be bump and bite or sneak attacks. Uh, so bump and bite is kind of how it sounds. They'll kind of bump against you before they attack you and kind of suss you out. Uh, sneak attacks, you don't have any indication that the shark is around and then they attack you. So both of those situations are quite likely. And his right leg was most likely either lost in a bite or it could have just been damaged to such an extent that no one could recover it um, when they buried him. But there's bite marks around the hip that suggest that it's definitely a part of the attack. There's also bite marks around the left wrist. It actually looks like it's been completely sheared off almost. And you don't tend to get attacks to the hands in shark attack cases unless it's a, a defensive motion because there's there's not a lot of meat on the hands. The, the shark's going to target more of the legs and the buttocks and the abdomen that have more things that are uh, appetizing to it. <laughs> um, it, get, it gets quite gruesome. Um, so I want to be mindful of the listeners. But the, the hand, that's most consistent with being lost in a defensive motion. So we can posit that he was, and especially with the the majority of lesions being concentrated to the lower body as well, we can posit that he was probably swimming and then defending an attack from below. Right. I see. Amazing. So he was most likely alive when the attack happens and probably bled out shortly afterwards after losing his right leg. You also suggest that the shark fed on him for a while afterwards. How do you think his body was then recovered and ended up being buried at Sycamore Cemetery? So we think his body was fed on afterwards um, just because of the sheer number of lesions on him. Um, And because also the, the lesions to his upper body are concentrated on the front of his body. Um, which suggests that maybe he was kind of floating face down in the water after. It's most likely that companions recovered his body relatively quickly because his body wasn't out in the water for a long period of time. His body is really quite complete, uh, except for the, the, the parts that were lost, um, most likely due to the traumatic incident. And going off of that, it's, it's reasonable to assume that he was recovered quite quickly. Um, this could have either been done by, by, by companions that were, or, or individuals that were nearby who either saw the attack or were there quickly after. His body could have also been washed ashore, um, but the way that you would test for that is to look for things in the living victim, you would look for things like water in their lungs, and, and we can't do that with him. But the most likely, scenario is that he he was recovered quite qu- quickly by people who knew him yeah i see as you mentioned he was probably in deep water when the attack happened so for his body to wash up on shore again it must have taken a while and there'll be signs of scavenging correct mm, so that can I, I believe that can depend on the tides as well mm-hmm. uh, and it doesn't have to be incredibly incredibly deep water so we, we get into a bit of a gray area where we have more likely scenarios than others right okay But his body certainly wasn't at sea for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the article very clearly states from the start that shark attacks are indeed rare, according to modern records. What does uh, number 24 tell us about human shark encounters in Jomon, Japan? So it tells us just another, I think, risk of a fisher, hunter-gatherer kind of lifestyle. That that's a very rare risk, uh, but it can happen. And shark teeth are present throughout the archipelago and and shark vertebra as well. Um, There's actually some caches of shark teeth from sites not not near Skumo. We don't think that Skumo, Kaizuka, like that that group was doing anything like shark hunting. Um, There is one shark tooth from from Skumo Shell Mount. But other sites from the Jomon period have these caches of shark teeth that indicate it might be possible that they were either going out shark hunting or participating in opportunistic shark hunting. And there's also things like ornaments, um, shark teeth ornaments buried with individuals. Uh, So you have human shark relations definitely going back far in time. 
And this is just just one instance of those, a, a very tragic instance, but just one of them. I see. And just one last question. What do we you know about number 24 from the way that he was buried? Uh, is being buried in the Shell Mounds something that was reserved for people of high status? No. Uh, it's He has quite a normative burial. Um, and like I said, but before now, uh, other than his, his odd burial position, which we can now pretty much link to just the state of his body at the time, um, uh, hasn't been noted a, as particularly extraordinary. And I think that's that's worth thinking about, is just that he was um, a normal individual within his community um, and was cared for. And the wonderful thing about re-examining museum collections is that these kinds of stories, not necessarily shark attacks, but re-examining of individuals and artifacts with more advanced techniques that have been developed over the years is, is certainly really worthwhile. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you for answering my questions, Elisa. Before we finish the episode, could you share with us what other projects you're currently working on? Yes, so I'm I'm working on finishing my doctorate currently, uh, looking, like I said, at that transition from the Jomon to the Ayoi and the role of human conflict in that by reevaluating uh, skeletal trauma um, in Jomon and Ayoi collections. But we're also looking at and we did this for, for a shark attack victim. Rick, uh, John Ponson, and I are working on creating a methodology of recording um, skeletal information within ArcGIS. So we, we treat the body as a map. And we're doing that for completeness of the skeleton and trauma. And we can overlay that data on, on top of one another for one individual and all of my individuals. So it makes it very easy to query and to look at patterns in the data. So that was the great thing about recording all of those injuries in 3D is that I could record them all painstakingly in Kyoto, but I could look at them all in the pattern of them in exquisite detail back in Oxford. And we're also working on um, applying that methodology to other kinds of analyses, like looking at degenerative joint disease patterns and how severe they were between individuals or groups and so on and so forth. And then looking at how we can make that kind of analysis available to people who aren't experts in GIS or 3D analysis. I see. Well, that sounds fascinating. We'll have to have you back on the show to go over that at some point. Uh, thank you for joining me on the show today, Alyssa. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Elias. It was wonderful. You can find a link to Alyssa's research profile in the description below. Next week, we'll be joined by Amanda Maguire, MA students at the University of East Anglia studying interdisciplinary Japanese studies to discuss representations of the Ainu in Japan and what the withdrawal of the Ainu dance from the 2020 Tokyo Olympics opening ceremony says about the theme of unity in Japan. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you for listening.